We do, in a way, become mirrors to each other collectively. There is so much we can learn from the different value systems that underpin both indigenous societies that are alive today and also more historic ones that have been studied by anthropologists to just understand different ways of being and the choices, therefore, we have for different ways of organising ourselves. We are in a unique moment in history. If we're willing to kind of listen to one another, then we're able to potentially bring together the best of those different possibilities. Hello and welcome to this week's episode. We have some exciting news in that we have started to work on our community app, which will be ready in September. We're exploring how we can use the technology to connect all of you that listen in ways that support us all living the wisdom that is shared in this podcast and connecting more with each other locally in person and globally through the app and events and learning experiences. If you want to share features that you will like and get involved in the app process in general, please go to our community and support page and fill in the questionnaire at the top of the page. On the same page, you can also become a patron and make a donation to The Future is Beautiful. We are open for larger one-off donations at this time if you want to support the building and creation of this app. And of course, if you want to become a monthly patron or a presence member, you can find out how there too. We have also just opened enrollment for the next round of the beautiful leadership immersion and mentoring journey, which will begin on the 26th of April. If you go to our website and click on courses, you will find all the details of how you can get involved. It's really fantastic. And I have loved witnessing people going through this process over the past two cohorts. There's the one-to-one mentoring, which is sessions with me that are very specific to what you might be going through. And then the immersion is an online group program where we have all these incredible masterclasses from guests that have been part of this podcast. This one will be spring into summer emergence energy. So if there are seeds you are planting and you want to support in bringing them to harvest, then come and join the adventure. This week's guest is Lily Cole, who some of you may know as a model and actress and campaigner. As an advocate for social, political and environmental issues, Lily Cole has employed technology writing, filmmaking, and public speaking as means to build awareness and encourage dialogue. Lily was awarded a first-class BA in History of Art from Cambridge University in 2011. In 2013, she co-founded Impossible.com, a technology company that uses technology to solve social and environmental problems, which incubated Wires Glasses. Lily has spoken at Davos, Google Zeitgeist, Wired, and Web Summit, was an affiliate at the Berkham Centre at Harvard University and holds an honorary Doctor of Letters from GCU. Lily is a patron of the Environmental Justice Foundation and has worked with the World Land Trust and WWF. As an actress, Lily has made over 15 films with directors including Sally Potter, Shaker Kapoor, Roland Joff, Mary Harron and Rianne Johnson. She has performed at the Globe Theatre, the Old Vic Theatre and Trafalgar Studios. Lily has written and presented several documentaries and has directed several short films. Balls, her first short fiction film, was released in 2018. In the summer of 2020, she published a book, audiobook and companion podcast, Who Cares Wins? Reasons for Optimism in Our Changing World. We explore the themes of gift economy, local community and technology optimism in this conversation called Our Reflections in Mirrors of Hope. We contemplate the question, how do we merge indigenous intelligence and modern technology to co-create better societies? I hope that this conversation inspires you to take hopeful action and live with a beautiful optimism of curiosity and resilience. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the we between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. 
every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is the revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. Lily, I am delighted to welcome you to the show. Thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. What does it mean to you to be co-creating a beautiful future? Mm, well, it's a leading question because you're assuming that we co-create, which I like and I agree with. But <laughs> <laughs> actually, interestingly, recently listened, I was slightly going, veering away from your question before I answer it, but I recently listened to Sam Harris's podcast on um, free will, but it triggered quite heated debates at home <laughs> because I had some kind of fundamental disagreements with it. His basic thesis is that free will is an illusion and that because of I mean, I might be slightly, hopefully I'm not misquoting him or mis or simplifying it, but this is how I understood his message largely, which is that because of the huge number of factors that we inherit and that we do not choose that determine who we are, whether that's our genes, the place we were born, the parents we had, the society we grew up in, all of these different factors that we didn't choose as such then determine the way we think and how we interact with the world. And so and then we live in this kind of causal reality where therefore we're never actually really free. We just think we're free. That's his, his basic argument. And I really philosophically rallied against it and will continue to rally against it because I do believe that, well, firstly, I believe in humility and that none of us really understand these questions and we should never be a hundred percent, like speak with a hundred percent conviction on like the nature of reality because it's way too mysterious and complex for any, anybody to claim, um, absolute knowledge of even scientists. Um, but that being said, my instinct when it comes to those questions is that we do co-create our reality with each other, obviously. And that implies an, 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 an amount of free will forces outside of ourselves, which some people might call science and some people might call nature and some people might call destiny and some people might call God, whatever. I'm not saying those are all interchangeable, but I'm just saying there are external forces maybe multiple ones. And we're also co-creating with those external forces. And for me, that that idea of co-creation is really beautiful because I love the idea of having agency, but also being part of something bigger than yourself. And so therefore needing to, having agency without having arrogance in a way, having agency, but also having to collaborate with the world around you and and with others. So sorry, that was a weird dovetail, but you triggered me <laughs> with the assumption we co-create the future. And so the exact question was what, sorry? <laughs> How do we co-create it? Or what are we co-creating? What does a beautiful future mean to you? Or what does it mean to, to be co-creating a beautiful future? And Lily, before we go any further, you do not have to apologize for dovetailing or um, not answering the questions. That's why I went that way. <laughs> As, um, yeah. And, and actually, it's, it's really interesting because I feel that it's part of our complexity as humans, right? That we come with this sense of who we are in the constructs that Sam Harris, for example, is talking about, but that we've now learned through epigenetics and all kinds of things that we have the power to change some of that and to change what's possible for ourselves in all kinds of ways, whether it's a hereditary disease, a physical disease, or whether it's a kind of mindset. And so I find it really interesting that that kind of aspect of what conditioning we have and where our opportunity to change it is and how we kind of live it. We can live in that relationship between the two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, hopefully, again, I'm not getting him wrong, but I think he would argue that even the desire to change our epigenetics or to change our, our situation is in a way predetermined because the, the thing that motivates us to change has also been kind of passed on to us in some way. But I would argue that that makes assumptions around what consciousness is 
and that actually consciousness continues to be a massive mystery um, that scientists still don't quite understand and that I still have maybe higher hopes for the idea of consciousness, <laughs> that consciousness does bring some kind of deeper magic, inspiration, soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, to these issues and therefore can be the agent of, of that decision to make a change or not. Well, I think co-creation is definitely a part of it. And there's actually been an interesting, I think, polemic in, I've noticed in like spiritual conversations and worlds for a long time. I don't think it's a new thing, but it feels like it's rising maybe more to the surface between this idea of like self autonomy and manifestation, you know, and all of that messaging around, you know, you can be the master of your own destiny. You can manifest things. You, this like really empowered sense of self. And then also the need for community and the idea of a universe, you know, one verse, the idea that everything is connected and how to marry that kind of those, those two positions, I think is quite interesting. And and I think that goes back for me to co-creation, that it's a kind of strange symbiosis of both being like true to yourself and working on yourself because you'll never change the world for want of a better cliche um, or create a beautiful future unless you can do that inside yourself right and in your own smaller reality I think all change begins with yourself but it's also it can't be self-focused you know it has to be something bigger than yourself right you can't you know have the whole world's burning and there's one person who's like having the time of their life doesn't really work, right? That's not a beautiful future. So how do you make it collective? Well, you can't make it collective. I guess you just have to do your piece and hope and listen and build relations and build relationships so that hopefully we can co-create the future that I think everyone deep down wants. I'm not saying everyone wants the same future, but I imagine deep down, like really deep, <laughs> like digging <laughs> very deep. Most people want similar things, right? Happiness, love, a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, security, a healthy environment, to laugh, to spend your time doing things you enjoy, you know, basic things. And so, yeah, if, if we all have a similar vision of where we want to go to, can we each do our piece to get there? It's interesting that piece around how human like core values are often the same. That was the, the very beginnings of of this project like 10 years ago I started asking people what's the future you choose and and getting people to share these visions of the future that they wanted to live in and what was important to them all those same things that you mentioned come up meaning family like somewhere safe for my grandchildren all of this kind of thing and then yet we find ourselves in this time of so much polarity in terms of the the detail and also the situation that we have with climate. I wondered in, in all of your research and, and all the different avenues that you've been exploring, why you think that happens, that, that, yeah, we want the same things, right? Nobody wants to live in a burning house. And, and yet what that actually um, creates in the world in terms of polarity and not being able to take collective action. No, oh, it's a really big question that I don't really have the answers to. I think it's a massive mix. I mean, I think there's a lot of legacy, you know, like thousands of years of ways of a kind of of a system and a way that systems were run, kind of, you know, colonial mindsets, capitalist mindsets. You know, actually, interestingly, I was listening to a speaker recently who was saying that basically capitalism is colonialism, it's just one transferred into the other over time. Whether you take it that far, there's definitely connections between them. And so the system that we're dominated kind of by today that shapes our functioning reality and also I think shapes how we think and how we see and how we value things comes out of hundreds or thousands of years of a quite troubled history. Of course, lots of beautiful things too and lots of progress too, but certainly when you study history, it's not like as uh, Obama once said, if you if you were going to be born at any time, anywhere, and you didn't know who you were going to be or where you'd be born, you would choose now. I think that's kind of true. You look at history and it's a bit like, ah. So yeah, I don't think we've like neatly separated ourselves from that history. And there is so much about the systems that we are born into and that we grow up in, that we assume to be normal, that come out of 
older legacies that I don't think bring out always the best aspects of human nature. So that maybe is is one piece of the puzzle. I mean, when I was writing my book, Who Cares Wins, I so I I was looking at different environmental solutions first and for, first and foremost, but then very interconnected with like social solutions too, because I see the two things as, as very interconnected. The book begins in a more pragmatic way, like kind of conscious consumerism and technology and politics and all of these quite pragmatic ways that people and companies and kind of the political machinery is trying to address major problems. And then the last quarter of the book, which personally I think is the most important, is called The Roots. And it goes much deeper into like the human psyche and and values really and what we can learn from indigenous cultures and completely different ways of organizing our society and different ways of being really i sort of feel that like that is the most important part that yeah fixing politics making like better political decisions or having better companies and better supply chains is all really important but it's all quite surface and those outputs will happen as a consequence of deeper shifts in more and more people asking, you know, what is the point of being alive and what life do I want to live and what values do I want to hold and what like legacy do I want to leave, which are hard and difficult, I think, questions to, to ask oneself. But I feel like that's really the key. And so, yeah, why, when you ask, why haven't we created that beautiful future that we all want? I think it's, yeah, a kind of mix of the trappings of the past that we are sort of like cultured into through our schools and our culture and our media and our systems. And also the whatever psychological issues we're personally dealing with, spiritual issues we're personally dealing with that inhibit us from being the best versions of ourselves. And that's not to say that some people aren't the best versions of themselves. I don't generalize, but I'm certainly not. And I'm sure many other people will relate to that, that maybe there is a kind of a version of themselves that they want to be. And at some point they may aim, you know, may get to be. I guess I'm like curious as like how does that individual desire and the way that we need to kind of activate as community come together as well as as the healing and I totally resonate with what you're saying around how we can change the systems and tweak them a bit right you and I first met through ethical fashion and cleaning up supply chains getting better rights and even now you look back say 12 years and there's still a lot of those same issues even though more and more companies have changed things along their supply chains it's been very slow they just patch up the system a bit they kind of make it a little bit less harmful what you're sharing about completely different ways of being that we could establish as communities as society yeah I wonder how you feel we can actually begin to move towards that and so much gets focused on like the individual right what can you do and so I'm sure you've done countless talks where everyone's like what do I do (laughs) how do I how do I do you know do this do I still need to be recycling well actually I heard recycling is now dangerous and (laughs) not the right thing and we get into all of these kind of loops about finding the right thing and then we have the path of the inner work at the same time as buying the sustainably made products and supporting regenerative projects and facing your own shadows, right? And understanding how the systems of oppression have affected you. It can still be very like lonely in that journey and you still don't really know what you're doing. The link that you said earlier about where community and, and kind of the collective is so key How do we actually make that shift from what we're doing being kind of individual to being part of a more collective community shift? (laughs) Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, where we ask big questions that nobody knows the answer to, (laughs) but we talk about it anyway. You know, we all have these questions, don't we? I mean, I think community is the key to so many of these issues. And I spent three or four years of my twenties full-time at like full-time, like 150% dedicated to trying to build a community platform that, you know, managed to do something. It was, we got to a hundred thousand users. It was an online platform that connected people to do favors for one another. And the whole point of it was 
to try and encourage more community, especially in cities. How do you get to know your neighbours? Actually, community, the word muni in community comes from the Latin for, for gift. So it's gift giving that builds community. Also, communication has that word. You give your words. You don't sell your words, right? You give your words and you create relationships through communication. So, yeah, I, I spent years trying to answer that question of like, how do we build community? And I wouldn't say I failed because in many ways it succeeded, but it didn't succeed in the way that I wanted it to. Ultimately, I decided that technology isn't necessarily the, the perfect vessel for building community. And I'm more interested in kind of super localized, you know, building my own community in a more super like localized real way. And I think that's possible, but yeah, but maybe challenging. I just read an interesting book called Tribe, which is about uh, very similar kind of questions. The writer was a journalist who covered a lot of wars. The kind of fundamental question it seems to probe is why is it that our modern societies are in so many ways, like way more affluent, you know, wealthy modern societies, way more affluent. The average person's life is way more affluent and comfortable than our ancestors. And yet there is like higher rates of mental health issues, depression, suicide than almost ever before. And his argument, based largely on his experiences of war and how war creates in a strange way a silver lining of community and solidarity that people miss when they come home the community and that kind of tribal history that we are part of and that we always forget we're part of is so core to human happiness and belonging and meaning so i still feel yeah that driving more communal values rather than individualistic values which is hard to do in a society that you know for many years has really really emphasized the the individual and continues to emphasize the individual social media i think helps with that pushing against that and trying to yeah focus on communal our own <laughs> existence as communal creatures yeah feels important and i think learning from indigenous communities because the way that our kind of modern societies function and the values that our modern societies um, are based on i think every, most people I, I don't like to generalize but i feel like we many of us just kind of take for granted as normal because it's it's been so normal. You know, most of us, if, if you grew up in a country like England where I did, that's your normal experience and that's life as you've known it. And it's easy to not be aware that there are completely other ways that societies can be organized and completely other va different value systems that can underpin societies. I don't like to romanticize indigenous communities or pretend that they don't have, you know, their own challenges or issues in the past. But I've been privileged enough to spend time with different indigenous societies and i feel like there's so much we can learn from the different value systems that underpin both indigenous societies that are alive today and also kind of more historic ones that have been studied by anthropologists to just understand different ways of being and the choices therefore we have for different ways of organizing ourselves because if you're looking at it purely from a sustainability perspective i mean indigenous communities have been around for hundreds of thousands of years without threatening their kind of natural habitat and their ability to survive on the natural habitat. Whereas our societies are so relatively new and we're already threatening our ability to sustain existence as we know it. So I think, yes, some humility from even a sustainability perspective is obvious. And then we might find that actually we're happier. There's like a pathway to happiness as well through trying to learn from different ways of being. I'll give you an example because I'm speaking very broad terms, but my friend James Sussman, who I write about in my book, uh, he's an anthropologist who's written a few books based on his work uh, with the San, the Bushmen in Botswana region of Africa. He spent over, I don't know, 20, 30 years of his life with those communities and as an anthropologist, lived with them, studied them, written about them. And as an example, they were, you know, nomadic communities historically hunter gatherers or gatherer hunters as he likes to call them because he makes the point that actually their diet was predominantly gathering not hunting so it makes more sense to emphasize it that way around so gatherer hunter societies who were nomadic and it was really like waste was discouraged obviously because if you're nomadic you don't want to be carrying around loads of stuff right and also there was a way they had a way of what they a practice they call in he calls insulting the meat which was a way to try and stop any one individual getting too much power within the group and to try and keep the group egalitarian for the most part. And so if a hunter managed to catch a really like 
big animal or you know a good animal for the for the community um instead of celebrating that and celebrating the hunter they would insult him and they would insult the meat which actually reminds me of a kind of british sense of humor but <laughs> but it was a way he argues of of making sure that just because somebody was particularly strong and particularly fast and had a, that kind of you know physical superiority in the group that didn't then transfer into kind of extra power within the group and it kept the kind of power distribution relatively equal among the members of the group and i just think that's so interesting because if you compare that to our society where we sort of in a way i mean there is the i just joked about the british sense of humor that you kind of you know you don't like people to rise too high and then you knock them down or whatever there is that kind of in a tongue in cheek way that goes on but we're also a society that like glorifies success and glorifies individual kind of affluence and aspiration so that feels very very different and and then you ask well what are the consequences of that you know what are the psychological consequences of us living in a society where it isn't egalitarian and we're all encouraged to almost be competing against each other to try and rise higher to try and succeed more to try and have a better a better share and even for the people who are winners of that game, does that make us happier? Let alone the many people who will be losers in that game. It's kind of, I guess, the crux of it is like kind of community versus and cooperation versus competition. Which of those forces are the greater? They'll both always both be playing a part, I'm sure, in the functioning of society. But which one do we allow to have greater emphasis? And then what are the consequences of that? Hello. We're taking a short pause from the conversation. On behalf of our team and our community, thank you for being here and co-creating The Future is Beautiful. Much dedication, love and time goes into the production of this show. We believe in being advertising free in a world that's always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. And so we make this show with you and for you, thanks to your support. There are three ways you can be more involved so we can share the vision, wisdom and creativity here as we explore what it means to be a human in this time. You can support the podcast by sharing it with your friends, posting episodes on social media and doing iTunes reviews. You can support as a patron by making a monthly or one-off donation of your choice. And with this, you join the global patrons group and monthly video calls where we share connection and insight. You get to know the other amazing patrons from around the world, their stories and their work, and you offer direct support to me and the team, as well as being brought into the behind the scenes of creating something like this. It sounds like a lot, but it's as much or as little as you want to get involved in. You can become a member of Presence, our membership collective of care and practice, where we explore how to embody the themes of the podcast with workshops, calls, special events, tree whispers, and powerful tools, practices, and rituals that you can bring into your life. This is open to absolutely everybody as we create an inclusive and diverse space that celebrates well-being as a human right, where we explore together what it means to be creative, courageous, and connected to ourselves, each other, and the earth. This is about embodying sacred activism. We love meeting patrons and presence members and how being part in this way weaves our lives together as well as making this show possible. If anything from this conversation has moved or inspired you, please get more involved. All information can be found at www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community. This show really can't go on without your patronage and presence membership, so please do make it happen. And now, back to the conversation. I was curious as to what ways of being that you've experienced in Indigenous cultures that you've been able to bring into your life and into your your family and your kind of immediate community? Some of these things pre-existed my contact with Indigenous cultures, but has just been enhanced by those experiences. But if I was to try and simplify it, it would be kind of reverence for nature and kind of respect for respect and understanding of the natural world around you. Not that I understand it particularly well, but I understand the need to understand it and I and I have a desire to understand it better and to build a relationship, I guess, with the with your immediate natural environment, community, seeing your identity within a community. And, and that's something again I'm still working on is like how do I I've been living through the pandemic 
because of our family situation, like we moved in with family in quite a remote place. And whilst it's been wonderful to be close to family, and I've appreciated that so much, I've really missed having a wider community. And I have a real longing to be closer to a wider community. And that's something I'm still kind of working through how I can situate my life to have that. And also I think spirituality, you know, that, and these are obviously I'm making sweeping generalizations. Indigenous cultures are very diverse and there's very, you know, there's many, many, many different ways that they may manifest around the world. But in terms of like overlying themes I've seen in the ones I've had access to either directly or through things, you know, um, research and, and reading, it feels like the spiritual relationship to reality is usually present and and brings a kind of value system and a depth maybe to their experiences, which I then think does shape what you value and how you see your relationship to the world. Storytelling, the, the emphasis on storytelling, I think is really interesting. And then how storytelling can connect you to your ancestors. If you think about community, it's not just the community in the present in those experiences I've seen, but it's also community historically. It's like really having a, a relationship to ancestry and a belonging that comes from that ancestry. And so hearing the stories that get passed, I think storytelling becomes an interesting medium of that because it becomes a way to connect each generation and the value systems of that community over time. So yeah, those are some of the examples I'd say. What about you? Because you've had some experiences, right, with Indigenous communities. I've not been and spent time with an Indigenous community directly well that's not true because I have in India and also in Kenya yeah but I guess a lot of my experiences say with the communities that are sharing medicines like with the West have been when they've been visiting in in the UK or in other places and then also indirect experiences through talking to people that have spent lots of time in those communities and all the things that you mentioned are aspects of what community it is and, and has always been in all kinds of parts of the world and all different kinds of cultures. When you dig deeper into, let's say, the pagan culture of the UK land, you find storytelling and singing together and rituals with the earth and a belief in something bigger that we're all part of and finding our, our roles within that community so we're not all the same and we're actually, there's an understanding of how my gifts are different to yours and so my role is different to yours and we're not trying to aspire to have the same one. Yeah, I feel like a lot of this is, is part of, of many cultures around the world and it's just in this Western kind of capitalist version some of that's got lost and capitalized right and then of course where religions at as well has become complex and then also with immigration even just my own family of origin and my ancestors they all told stories and were part of ritual and prayer together but my parents moved to England. And so we were, we were in the middle of Derbyshire without any of that, without access to that regularly. And so it's not so complicated that, that aspect of community, of being able to be with others in a place that's beyond the ego, where we understand that we need each other and we have something to offer each other. And that what I'm experiencing, you're experiencing in some way, and even an example of that is I have this program called the Beautiful Leadership Immersion that is connected to The Future is Beautiful. And we have lots of a guest faculty from people that have been on this podcast. And we were having a group session last night for the current people in that program. And when we were doing the check-in, a lot of people were saying, I was so wiped out yesterday and I felt so tired we got into a discussion about, well, okay, it's partly to do with the moon and it's partly to do with, with all kinds of things. And we're so used to personalizing everything. So I'm tired. What's wrong with me? Okay. I haven't had enough green juice. I haven't done enough yoga. I ate this. It's because of this person that I live with that's annoying me. And it's because I'm not good enough because I haven't succeeded enough, but everything becomes a story of I. And actually, so many of those 
waves of even just how we feel are collective. And I find it very powerful when we're able to share that. And when you're all physically together, it's very obvious, right? You can actually see, okay, everyone's everyone's got diarrhea, for example. Okay, it's something we all ate, you know, or it's or everybody's everybody woke up really early this morning, like, and everyone was up, like something with the birds. You kind of get these connecting moments, but in the ways that we live our lives, we often think it's us when it's not. And I feel like something really interesting has happened over this winter that we we don't know what it is yet. And a lot of people that I've been talking to have, for example, shared feeling a lot of fatigue this winter, feeling really not themselves. You know, you can come up with like, okay, well, it's lockdown, it's the pandemic, it's this and it's that. And we don't really know what, what's happening in terms of consciousness collectively through this period of the winter. And, and actually just, just here on the beach in Devon, where I've, I've spent the, this winter, in the last day or two, people are like, hi, I've got energy again. And, you know, the spring equinox came, something lifted. And you're like, well, that person's got a completely different story, career, family situation, diet, and they've also been in that same cycle. And so I feel like that's some of where we miss out with the individual story because we're not able to experience things together. And also with that experience, the cycles, and also in those cycles, there are often people that are at like a different part of the cycle so that they can kind of, you know, provide to the community. That's something that I've been feeling into a lot, how can we create that kind of dynamic in this this situation that we're in, which at the moment is very isolated because of of the pandemic? Well, that's the thing that, I mean, per this whole conversation around the need for community, this last year feels like it's just stripped that in an unbelievable way. I mean, of course, there'll be exceptions of people who were living in community before countries went into lockdown but I think for the vast majority it's been a very isolating experience and I was just googling it the other day and like the mental health stats are really bad you know if people have been really suffering and I've certainly experienced that myself in this time and and so, so for me that kind of highlights it even further yeah how unnatural it is it's how fundamentally unnatural it is really because if you are we, if you think about it we are animals like it's not that long ago that we had the cognitive revolution that maybe separated, you know, in some ways, the human pathway from other animals. But we are fundamentally still animals, and we've been living in tribal groups for our, the vast majority of our history. So, I think there's also something from a biological perspective that's, that's disassociating in the level of isolation and virtual connection <laughs> that we're moving into. And yeah, I hear your point on on yeah the collective how we personalize our feelings and they are collect they are often more collective than we realize but we don't necessarily have the channels or the ways to understand that i certainly know that like if i'm in it with a group of people i mean there are sometimes it sometimes that doesn't happen but for the most part if i'm with a group of people who are really happy it lifts my spirits you know i just it's like osmosis right my my feelings change and the opposite, if I'm with a group of people who are really grumpy and miserable, it pulls down my spirits, you know? So we do, in a way, become mirrors to each other collectively. The other thought I had when you were speaking was about the kind of pagan, indigenous kind of UK history. And I listened to your episode with Sam, who's at Sam Lee, who's a friend of mine. And I'd actually interviewed him as well for a podcast episode I did on Who Cares Wind, where I looked at indigenous cultures and had Wade Davis, the anthropologist, Speaking about some of these themes, individualism and community, I had Putani and Bira Yawanawa, two members of the Yawanawa tribe, who I know quite well. And then at the end of the episode, I had Vanessa Nakate talking about Ugandan tribes. And at the end of the episode, I thought, I really want to talk about what it means to be indigenous in a UK sense. And so I asked Sam to come and talk about his perspective of kind of searching for the indigenous history in, in the UK. And I think that's such an, I think it's such important work he does and an important work to do in a kind of simplification of history our own indigenous kind of culture was decimated and colonized 
in the same way that many other indigenous communities around the world have been decimated and colonized. It just happened much earlier in the UK, you know, like thousands of years earlier. And so the traces, like trying to retrace that culture is much harder because a lot of the language has been lost and the oral traditions have been lost. And, you know, it's just, it's an older history, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible to try and access. And it's not also really important. Kind of want to say, how do we kind of balance some of these indigenous ways of being with the technology that we have? It makes me actually want to go back a question and ask, why did you close Impossible? You mentioned it wasn't doing what you wanted it to do and that you didn't feel like tech could provide that in terms of community. Can you share a bit more about that and then and then maybe yeah, tell us? Yeah, something? sure. So I was a kind of, yeah, tech utopian where I was like, oh my God, technology is amazing. The internet's amazing. It can allow us to do all these kind of crazy radical things that were not possible for so long. And what if we marry that to yet yeah, old ideas like yeah, community and the gift economy? And what I learned in trying to do that And it may be that somebody else manages to pull it off. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but the main issue, I think, I mean, there are lots of issues, but I think the main issue is the realization that technology is so expensive to run, to operate, like so expensive to do it well. And specifically, I mean, I was doing a social network. If you're trying to compete with the experience that people are having on Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and all these things, you're competing with companies that have billions of dollars running through them every 10 minutes. For us as a tiny, tiny, tiny startup that was nonprofit with a small amount of funding, we did our best, but it was just very expensive to try and make it good enough and then also to keep it updated because technology is always evolving. So to keep editing it and changing it and changing it. And so what I realized is there's a kind of fundamental paradox where in order to actually make it good enough, I would have to make it pretty capitalist. I'd have to like probably put loads of advertising and, you know, go down a pathway that's that most of those social networks exist in that felt antithetical to actually the ideas behind it. And so that was just really, it was very stressful for me personally and financially. And it also felt like a a square that I couldn't circle or a circle I couldn't square, whatever that phrase is. (laughs) So yeah, the kind of financial pressure was one of the main things. On a personal level, I mean, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm like, I'm not a technologist by heart. And so me running it wasn't ideal. And it's not what I want to be doing my life longer term. So at some point I also had to draw the line because I was just giving it all my energy and all my time. That's the kind of, it's quite a boring answer, but that's it. And I think the real, the realization I had actually is interesting. The process of building it had demonstrated the idea over and over and over again, because from the minute that I like said about trying to, to do it and sharing that intention with people, it was extraordinary the amount of generosity I met and the number of people that were trying to help on that journey, like an extraordinary group, many of whom I'm still friends with. So it kind of created a community offline in the process of trying to build it. And then it it worked. I mean, as I said, we had over 100,000 users. We had loads of things happening, you know, loads of beautiful stories coming through. We had a news platform where we'd write about some of those stories and really like heartfelt, you know, none of it was like groundbreaking stuff, but it was just these like, it was, I think, the fact that people were doing kind things for each other for no reason other than to do kind things for each, for each other that was really touching people and making people feel touched by the platform, even if they were small gestures. In a way, it was, it was demonstrating the idea and it was kind of proving the thesis. I think what I realized is we don't necessarily need to build this like expensive apparatus to try and encourage this, that actually all you need is the kind of the spirit behind it, which is a the desire to give and the openness to receive and that each of us can make that choice any given moment to try and give more, to ask for help when we need it and to be open to receiving help, both being very important. I don't think it's not just about giving, it's also about receiving and that that inner shift is the most important thing. And it's something available to all of us at any time. And of course, always or already does happen, but those we can grow that part of our society. The British, British government, for what it's worth, say that the gift economy, which is what they kind of call it, which is people doing things for each other as favors, is already bigger than GDP. So it's already a big part of our economy and our culture. If you think about, you know, doing favors for friends or helping out your parents or childcare or helping a stranger, all these little things really add up and I guess my realization was that we can just choose if we want to make that a bigger part of our lives and to put more energy into 
that way of being. And we don't need this like expensive, cumbersome technology that's ultimately like kind of paradox in itself and how it's going to run you know, to manage that. Now, that being said, if someone out there wants to try and do it again and like gets it right, I'd be so happy. Um, but, and there are examples like, I mean, Wikipedia, Jimmy was, Jimmy from Wales from Wikipedia was helping me from the early days. And then Wikipedia is an amazing example. It's one of the only examples of like a massive internet success that's not capitalist and that's managed to survive in a nonprofit way. So it is possible. It's just, yeah, very, I guess, unusual. We're doing something on very, very small scale just because for me, I mean, this podcast is a gift economy offering to the world. But what I found really interesting is the the people that have become part of it, you know, the community that exists, that listen to to every episode on their runs, that make a cup of tea, that go sit by a tree, you know, that have listened to every single episode and that we've come together on WhatsApp groups and Zoom calls and people have met and people are collaborating, people are moving in together, you know, lovely things are happening from that space. And so I've been exploring how we can, how we can use the technology just to help make that happen just in small ways, because something that people often come with is, is that they, they find something like the future is beautiful or who cares wins and then they find that they don't know a lot of other people in their physical life that are interested in those things when you have those relationships that are based on that real common ground and asking the same questions and wanting to bring the same things into being I feel like that gives us more strength to offer it into maybe our physical communities where, you know, we might be the one that's kind of going in there saying, hi, like, let's do this. Let's have a gathering. Let's share this. Let's have a, a swishing party for our clothes or like wh- whatever those things are that you can do. And so, yeah, we're working on that, but it's, it's not going to be a big expensive <laughs> technology. No, it's beautiful. And that's the thing. I've seen so many examples and more and more, which is encouraging of people who are making those choices of like, just pay me a donation, for example. I've come across that more and more as a, I had acupuncture the other day and the acupuncturist, I asked the price. And you said anything up to this price. I've had so many examples the other day, I helped some, a friend or something and I traded her a gift in exchange because it was her work. Those examples seem to come up more and more of people just being in that mindset of a little bit more like gift economy spirit where it's not, yeah. but yeah, that shift is positive. And, and yes, we have all these technology tools that are great for helping to facilitate, but I wasn't in the position to design one around it. And actually, I think that the idea itself is too big for one technology to try and cover, you know, that actually it's, it's, ma- it's better if it just manifests organically in a million or billion or trillion different strange and grassroots ways, whether that's somebody yeah, finding your podcast and then meeting someone else and then creating community through that connection. It's in the kind of grassroots ways that it should manifest rather than a top-down approach of like one system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And then in terms of your other question, balancing indigenous values with kind of modern tech and modern development, I think it's a really important question. And I think that that's the extraordinary opportunity that we have right now, that for all that I I'm praising indigenous, like not all, but you know what I mean? Like many indigenous values and cultures and the the need we have to maybe learn from them. There's no denying that there have been extraordinary positive benefits and outcomes from kind of modern societies, uh, whether that's technology or healthcare or, you know, there's a kind of long, long list you could give or political structures of how many amazing things our societies have achieved through a very different mindset and the combination of those possibilities I think is is the moment we're in now that's so exciting I was in Portugal when the Yawanawa who I mentioned earlier so um, Bira and Putani came for the first time here from where they live in in Acre in Brazil and um, I write a little bit in the book about that conversation some other ones I've had with them but I remember Bira saying was that he felt very emotional to be in Portugal because from Portugal is where the the boats originally left that you know colonized South America and 
decimated indigenous communities. I think they went down from 8 million to half a million in general. And then the Yawanawa in particular was nearly completely wiped out. They went down to 60 or 70 people in the, I think, the 20, 20th century. The Yawanawa have been really fighting to kind of reclaim their traditions, their language. They've been for, for a long time kind of taught by missionaries. They weren't allowed to use their language. They weren't allowed to use their kind of practice, their shamanic culture and then they fought back and they reclaimed the language reclaimed their shamanic traditions have in recent years been kind of sharing that with outside cultures and this was their first trip to to portugal and he said yeah he felt very emotional to be here given that history but he said something so beautiful he was like i'm i'm wearing a watch i'm wearing flip-flops i'm speaking portuguese my son and my family are playing you know guitars and western instruments all these things, let alone, I guess, the plane that brought them there, all these things are blessings and, you know, we're grateful for. And there's so much that our cultures can learn from one another. And it was this kind of extraordinary forgiveness, I guess, given that history and this recognition that there are very different skills and outcomes of these different societies. And we are in a unique moment in history where we're able to, if we're willing to kind of listen to one another, then we're able to potentially bring together the best of those of those different possibilities. That's my my hope anyway. Would you still say that you're a tech optimist or is it kind of a bit different to that? Is it you... No, I'm pretty tech neutral now. <laughs> <laughs> I see technology like like a tool, you know? And it is a, I mean the tool like a hammer was early technology, right? And you could use a hammer to build a house, you could use a hammer to destroy a house. It's not inherently good or inherently bad. It just has a power and that power can be used in different ways. And I think it's the same of of modern and digital technology, that it's very powerful and that power can manifest. It's not inherently good or bad, but it can be used in ways that are more positive or more negative. I think I'm slightly more cynical in a way because it feels like so much of technology now is money-based, such a big business, and the motivations behind it, I find maybe compromise what the original vision of the internet was when Sir Tim Berners-Lee gave away kind of the code for the original internet 30, I think 33 years ago, uh, 32 years ago. Yeah. So I'm, I'm slightly more cynical maybe now than I was 10 years ago, but I still think, you know, that we have to also appreciate the extraordinary things that are afforded to us through technology, like us being able to have this conversation right now is, you know, and a positive, the fact that I can stay in touch with friends and family around the world is a huge positive. The fact that I can just learn information. I mean, of course, you've got to like, you know, dodge bullets of misinformation, but there's this kind of vast library of of possibilities, information, worldviews online that I can access and anyone can access, not anyone, but most, you know, many people is a real positive. So yeah, it's a mixed bag, I guess. What about you? I would agree with what you say. I mean, definitely when we look at the tech world now I mean we can see it's not being utilized in the most fair community-minded way the inequality the power the focus on selling us stuff that we don't need you know even just the experience of the beginnings of Facebook like oh yeah I can like see what my relatives around the world are doing and now it's like oh I can be sold things constantly and my friends don't even see my posts it's it's a whole different a different experience I have two thoughts on that one is that it needs better regulation you know that For sure yeah that that's a big part of the problem that most of the technologies of companies are just massive monopolies it's kind of extraordinary they've been able to become these massive monopolies I think Facebook control 80% of social media content online, roughly. Amazon control the vast majority of servers, I think. Google control the vast majority of searches. You know, they're monopolized, basically. And in most industries, there are regulations and rules that stop any one company from having that much power. And there have been, I think, more and more kind of political efforts gaining traction in recent years to try and change that and challenge that, which I think is positive. And then the thing I think that personally we can all do is actually just recognize that nothing is free, contrary to my whole gift economy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we can, we, can handle, we can handle the complexity. <laughs> so obviously, yeah, like somebody does you a favor, it's free, great. Although actually in a funny way, it's not free because you probably then feel like grateful to them and then you'll probably do a favor back. And that's the interesting complexity of the gift economy. But, but that conversation aside, 
when it comes to interacting with large corporations, of course, nothing they're doing for you is free. Like they can't run a business model on just giving out free stuff forever. Yet our experience of many of these platforms is completely free. I'm thinking of like social media and search. We don't, most people are not paying for those services. And then you really have to wonder how you are paying and be mindful of the fact that you are paying, but just maybe not with your money. You'll be paying with your clicks and your attention and your engagement and your time. Applying then the kind of logic of conscious consumerism to technology, I think is really important that it's a different type of consumerism. It's not going to a shop and it's deciding to buy A rather than B, but it's recognizing that your, your actual engagement and your time is a currency and how much do you want to spend it on those platforms? Because they will, they will definitely encourage you to spend as much as you possibly can. <laughs> um, they're incredibly addictive. They manipulate you to spend <laughs> as much time as they, you they can. I mean, they're designed by inte- very, very intelligent people to try and make them as addictive as possible. That's the truth. Yeah. And for me personally, I've definitely found myself to become at times addicted to some of those platforms and had to like really try and mediate my relationship to them. Okay, so I have a, a, a final-ish question, and of course, it's a big one, <laughs> which is, you've been exploring climate and what's happening in this world for a long time, like at least 12 years that I know of, and I'm sure most of your life, right? Um, especially if Sam Harris is right, and we just are who we are, <laughs> and- <laughs> and even the process of writing this book, Who Cares Wins, you've been writing this over a, a number of years and you're doing a lot of deep research. Within this context of mass extinction and what we know about the climate science and what we know we don't really understand, you know, what we know might actually be worse than, than we can measure. And with how slow we are to act and yeah the disappointment of seeing how fast we can act for this pandemic for example and many of us have been hoping for something even just five percent of this in in relation to climate for many many years and that even at the start of this pandemic a lot of us environmental minded people were saying yes this is great this is our time and then It's like, oh, okay, no, climate's been pushed off the agenda because there isn't space for it actually with everything that's happening with the pandemic. And so my question is, within all of that, how do you manage on a a kind of personal level with knowing all of that and staying engaged and active? Yeah, and hopeful and optimistic. Yeah, I mean, it oscillates. I'm more hopeful some days than others. And I'm more engaged some days than others. I think writing the book was really difficult in some ways because, I mean, at times it was very inspiring because I was researching and meeting extraordinary people and projects that gave me a lot of hope for sure. But there was also quite a few times where I was brought to tears because when you really, truly dig into like the science and the data and the climate science and the the statistics and just the truth, the reality around where we're at, it's really hard hitting. I'd say most days of my life, I just don't engage on that, on that level of truth. I actually, my last podcast episode was called How Much Should We Care? And it was kind of exploring this question of cognitive dissonance, kind of uh, making the argument that most of us are in a kind of perpetual state of cognitive dissonance between the reality and what we allow ourselves to believe, i.e., we say we believe in climate change. We might post about petitions or, you know, like sign them or go on marches, or whatever, but we don't truly deeply believe it because if we truly deeply believe the information, it's just too earth shattering. It's too difficult, you know? So we kind of have to kind of exist in this state of like denial, really, that everything's going to be okay. And yeah, I can still get on with my job and date people and go on holiday and like all these other things that we entertain maybe our lives with despite the fact that this is like fundamental existential threat (laughs) underneath our very existence. So I think I'm definitely in that state of cognitive dissonance most of the time. Just, I guess, being present to my personal reality in a way helps. I think the other thing that's helped is taking small actions. 
And I always feel wary saying that because I don't want to imply in any way that I'm perfect because I'm far from it. I'm full of contradictions, just like anybody is. And most environmentalists I know are too. But that being said, I do have tried to make changes to my life and my lifestyle and my choices. And I continue to, to try and make better choices and to try and make ones that feel more aligned with the information that I am aware of and what feels truthful inside. And as over time, and I'm still on that journey, but as I've become, I guess, more aligned with my kind of inner understanding and my outer actions, it's also, I think, helped me because I have the maybe a bit more peace that at least I don't have to feel like so hypocritical and guilty on the mix of everything else, you know, <laughs> like I'm doing what I can in my own small world. And I also do think that humans are extraordinary and we've ex- achieved extraordinary things and that this challenge is not insurmountable. And there's been in the last 15 or so years that I've been working in the sustainable fashion, environmental, all of those different kind of spaces, technology spaces, the level of change I've seen is extraordinary. Like it's not to say it's enough, as you said earlier, like sustainable fashion may have grown in a huge amount, but it hasn't like fixed itself yet. There's still a long way to go. But just the fact that these concerns and these conversations and some of the ideas that felt incredibly niche 10 years ago Mm. are now like in the FT every day and feeling super mainstream and dominant in the kind of political economic conversations, let alone the kind of consciousness, individual, you know, community conversations is really, really encouraging. So I take hope from that, that we can co-create a better future. And with that, as a final question, we're, we just started this last week offering a call to action at the end so that as well as, you know, just the, the shifts in perspective and that sense of community that comes from having this conversation, uh, all our friends listening can actually click on something and whether it's donate to something or support something, sign a petition, what is it that you'd like our friends here to do? And action or a click. It's a call to action, but it's something that that they can kind of click and and kind of do. Claire last week, she did an inner one and an outer one. So obviously the inner one isn't a clickable thing. So you can have two. Well, the the main one that comes to mind, it's not very clickable, although there's a book I could suggest that is clickable (laughs) and that you could read if you need to learn more or be persuaded, is that if you care about kind of sustainability in these conversations and I feel I always hate saying it because it just feels so like boring and preachy and like uh, but it's just true is reducing the amount of animal product we eat and use and that's something that everyone can act on because we make those choices three times a day usually (laughs) and has I think the most media profound impact that we can have in, in in terms of climate change, biodiversity loss, and also pandemic risk. I don't know if you saw, but there's quite a few papers that came out last year, including from the UN, connecting the rise in pandemics with the same factors that are driving the climate and biodiversity crises. Animal, the increase in the need for animal agriculture and the huge amount of land, let alone emissions that that uses and creates, is one of the principal drivers for pandemics as well. So yeah, I've been like a version of vegetarian since I was 10. And I feel when I write the book, I call myself a vegan as a kind of play on vaguely vegan because I try and be vegan, but not perfectly. I may even try and be full vegan because it just, having read all the papers and the information, it just feels so clear that that's the kind of almost the biggest thing that we can each individually do. I know that a lot of people listening also feel guilty about their oat milk consumption. <laughs> <laughs> That have already become vegan. I feel the wrong audience to talk to you. Probably like, oh, <laughs> and they're like, "You're only vegan, bitch." <laughs> <laughs> I've been living in Devon for the last five months, and I am consuming fair amounts of locally produced ice cream. <laughs> so yeah, I'm with you on that at the moment. My vaguely vegan is I try not to have any dairy, but then I have eggs occasionally if I know that they're free range or whatever. I have fish occasionally. That's the way I've navigated it. Apparently, if you see Seaspiracy on Netflix, you'll never eat fish again. So (laughs) I'm yet to watch that one. Anyway, so 
in terms of oat milk, yeah, no, I hear you. Tetra Pak is a nightmare. I actually, during the pandemic, first lockdown last year when I was still in the UK, I took to making my own nut milks to try and reduce the amount of Tetra Pak we were going through. And it was actually quite easy. So that's an option. I don't like mine as much. I've, I've tried a lot and I just haven't quite got it quite right. Yeah. Don't know what. I don't know. Everything is a contradiction. That's the problem. Yeah. I look at meat a lot in the book and also have a podcast episode on it with people arguing that actually regenerative agriculture, including animals, is also really positive and can be really positive for the land. So none of these things are simple um, and none of the answers are obvious. But avoiding just reducing the amount that we consume and opting for better when you do consume it is, I think, important. Yeah. And you mentioned a book. Was that going to be We Are the Weather? We Are the Weather. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. That you guessed, yeah. Well, I, I listen to your podcast. So. You know, I'm already a massive fan. I'm always yeah. a book. I should be getting royalties by now. <laughs> but it's a really good book. Another book, good book I've just started that multiple people have recommended to me is um, Tribe by Sebastian Younger. I just started reading and I'm loving a book called The Overstory by Richard Powers. Have you read that yet? I haven't, no. I mean, I've been told about it now by three or four different people. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It's a novel, but it's very environmental and it's just so beautifully written. I'm only, I mean, I shouldn't be so confident in my recommendation. I'm on page 15, but I love it so far. <laughs> Excellent. And did you want to add anything else to your call to action? I mean, I'll mention the charity that I've been a patron of forever. I really, really love. They're called the Environmental Justice Foundation. I think they're like a very small charity, but they're very... They're very thoughtful, I think, in how they approach problems. They look at like business and the economic ways of trying to deal with issues. And so, yeah, I, I really love their work. I love the World Land Trust, who managed to buy up pieces of land around the world, never in their own name, using local community names um, for conservation. And I've more recently been supporting a charity called Climeworks, who are very interesting. They're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it underground in Iceland in basalt stones so yeah it's called direct air capture so it's a, for me it's a more interesting way of offsetting for example if I travel it feels like a good good way to try and offset that beautiful and how can everyone connect with you more deeply of course buying your book My and for listening to your podcast <laughs> <laughs> hire you for a cup of tea was that no not hire me can you imagine <laughs> I said, come over for a cup of tea. Come over for a cup of tea. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Who Cares Wins is my podcast. It's free. The book is not free, but it's also called Who Cares Wins. And on my website, lilycole.com, I may, I was thinking about starting a newsletter. I might start a newsletter at some point. I do very occasionally also post on Instagram at lilycole, but per the earlier conversation, I've been dieting. So I'm, I'm planning to post more on it. So Who Cares Wins stuff. So you can look there as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lily. It's been lovely to be with you. Yeah, you too. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast. And so it's made possible with you, our community. If you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community and support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?